Hi, my name is Estev. This scene is set in a gorgeously futuristic health and wellness center to help us slow down time and really learn to understand others. We'll be using the example of a doctor and a patient to highlight the importance of being green in day-to-day -day situations where empathy matters most. If you're watching this video, you now understand from the Green Blue Red Basics video the importance of using each color in the best order and best proportion. As you remember, starting from green is usually a good way to connect with people. From the three levels of communication video, you've seen how important it is to focus more on the nonverbal behaviors and the deeper intentions rather than only focusing on what people say. We already covered the green behaviors and you were probably wondering exactly how you could talk more green. So in this video, we'll take a special focus on the green verbal techniques along with the green intentions and reveal a psychological theory about how to navigate in people's minds when you ask them questions. For those of you working as consultants, coaches or project managers, you'll probably find the deep dive on how to use green to cultivate trust at different stages of a client relationship very useful. As you know, being green or focusing on the other is always helping people to get along. But can you think of any situation where being green is particularly powerful? Let's start by looking at five of these situations. This first one might be the most obvious application of green, interviewing people. Whether you're doing recruiting interviews, ethnographic interviews in people's homes, annual performance reviews, or even carrying out user testing and market research focus groups, being green is what you need to do if you want to get any useful insights and results. In relationship sales, as a project manager or as a consultant, you constantly need to manage some of your key relationships. Being green, as many good salespeople already know, is the key to managing your client's expectations. We'll look at some concrete ways you can do this in the how to cultivate relations section of this video. When you work as an expert consultant or coach to solve problems, even though you might be perceived as the hero savior, you'll need to fully understand which problems you're trying to solve before jumping into red action. Too often, consultants and coaches give a bad name to these difficult professions by offering general blue opinions with one-size-fits-all red solutions before having invested enough time or effort with green questions to fully understand the situation. Turning a group of experts into a high-performing team takes a lot of green. It requires taking into account not just the rationals of project management like deadlines, roles and responsibilities, but also a lot of being green with your intentions. An excellent way to concretely do this while building trust is, for example, with regular presencing interviews of your team, which helps you to transform connection, kindness and respect into collective intelligence. Perhaps you've already considered that your leadership authority can come in three colors. More on this in other videos where we open up the topics of hosting groups and polarity between people. It's easy enough to be green with people you get on well with, but conflicts is where green is the most powerful. Any conflict mediator will confirm just how much green questions and techniques will help you to establish a neutral and positive ground for solving tricky situations, which inevitably arise between people. So there are many situations where you'll need to use green and most of the time you'll be tempted to ask questions. The problem is we often unknowingly turn our questions into blue or red questions. For you to understand how to ask powerful green questions, let's look at the difference between these three. Often, we remember from school questions which were asked to dig around and check that we understood something. Blue questions are when you use opinionated, leading questions, such as multiple choice questions, which you can answer with yes or no. In some cases, blue questions are just ego requests for validation, with, don't you think my prototype looks great in this picture, for instance? or a way of expressing opinions and judgments with 
Do you think that advances in artificial intelligence is a good or bad thing? This is useful to narrow down a conversation to a specific area of focus, like in academic debates or problem solving, but beware of using blue questions in research because the leading nature of blue questions can take your inquiry away from what is really relevant to the other person. Police interrogations are classically where you'll find the most read questions, usually to influence people to give confessions. For example, do you want to explain what you were doing last night or remain in custody for another 24 hours? Mothers are also very good at asking red questions such as, don't you think you should tidy your room? When you use leading and directive questions with an intention of influencing, fixing problems, changing others or any other form of common action, they're called red questions. As you can imagine, red questions are often unpleasantly perceived and can be seen as an aggression if you're asking them in an interview. Designers know that asking how might we questions is the key for opening up a good brainstorm. Open questions starting with how, what, when or why are usually green questions because they let the other person keep some control over where the inquiry is going. As a researcher or interviewer, green questions help you to understand what people mean and think by giving them control instead of forcing them to agree or disagree with you. Some companies encourage people to ask why as a way of building an empathic culture. Beware, though, of using a red or blue tone of voice when asking why, as it can be perceived as a criticism. So as a recap, blue questions are useful for digging in a particular direction when your intention is to pragmatically learn or validate something specific with opinionated questions like in quantitative testing and research. Red questions are when you intend to influence people with leading questions like in police interrogations. Green is for when you intend to understand with curiosity and empathy by using open questions in the context of qualitative research or interviews. Now is a good time for you to pause this video and think about which type of question you use most often at work. Let's now look at two examples of how a doctor might use questions. So let's use the head-up display to take a snapshot of communication with the anchor being the doctor. As the patient walks in and offers her hand as a greeting, the doctor ignores her while raising her finger in an authoritative manner to tell the patient to wait for her to finish typing. She then asks, Well, what is it? Talk. Which is a red question followed by a red order. The non-verbal behaviour is, as you can guess, imposed red timing. The patient, other than feeling perhaps insulted, will most likely interpret this as a red intention of simply fixing her health problem. Hopefully your doctor is slightly more respectful. Let's now look at a greener example. In this snapshot of communication, the doctor, still being the point of reference for our color coding, notice how, after the initial greeting, she invites the patient to sit down with a smile and eye contact. Being a dermatologist, she asks, what kind of problems do you have with your skin? This is an open green question, and you can see how the doctor is making open eye contact, which is green body language. The patient will most likely interpret her intention as being empathy towards her. Of course, with today's administrative pressure, many doctors are in a hurry to deal with patients, but notice how here, with the similar amount of time used as the red doctor did, she'll most likely get a better response and faster diagnosis when the patient feels safe enough to open up quickly. So clearly, asking green questions can be a powerful way to save time as well as understand others at work. Now how can you formulate your green questions? You cannot always prepare your questions beforehand. So here is a theory which will help you to quickly choose the right type of green open questions. You've probably heard that it's good to ask five times why to really understand. This, 
actually comes from the personal construct theory by George Kelly. He proposes that humans construe or understand reality through a series of bipolar scales. He calls these scales constructs and compares them to lenses through which we understand the world around us. Each construct consists of a pair of two opposing sides. For example, one of the constructs which is developed early in childhood during the terrible twos period could be the me versus other construct where your mind evaluates a situation based on if it's more to do with me or more to do with others. Because constructs are based on our experiences and observations, we all have a unique and different set of constructs. As we'll see in the video about ego, comparison between things is how we develop our sense of identity and how we learn about the world. We learn by comparison. This explains why two people can have such a different interpretation of one same event. Understanding people's specific and individual constructs is the closest you can get to looking at reality from that person's point of view. That's why Kelly's theory is such a powerful way to be green and understand others. When we're trying to make sense of an event or situation, Kelly suggests that we're also able to pick and choose which construct we want to use. This sometimes happens as an event unfolds, but we can also reflect back on our experiences and then choose to view them in different ways. This is why taking time to reflect on your work as we saw in the video on reflection and feedback can be so useful. It allows you to consciously upgrade your constructs. Kelly believed that these constructs are constantly changing and are organized in a hierarchical fashion. Let's use the mental model of a tree to represent how a person's mind is construing reality. At the bottom of the tree, the roots would be the most basic constructs people have, such as good versus bad, while as we go up in the tree, there are many more complex constructs, such as pedigree dogs versus mixed breed dogs. Constructs used to formulate opinions, attitudes, are usually near the top of the tree, while deeper beliefs, values and intentions are connected to the lower parts of the tree. But how does this help us communicate? When you really want to understand a person, for example in an interview, you can use card sorting exercises to tease out a person's constructs. If you want to learn more about how to use this theory, for example in organizational design or market research, I suggest you watch our extra video on advanced interview techniques. In clinical psychology, a technique called laddering was developed to navigate around a person's tree of constructs. When you ask why questions, you go down in the tree, while when you ask how questions, like how might we design questions, you go up in the tree. Let's say you're trying to understand a person's deeper beliefs and values at work. Asking why will get you there faster than asking how questions. Usually if you try and ask five times why, after two or three times you'll most likely hit their consciousness barrier. This is where a person says, um, I don't know. It is unethical to try and dig deeper unless you're qualified as a psychologist. So most of the time it's enough to only ask why a few times and respectfully stop when you hit that barrier. If you're stuck in a conversation or interview which is going nowhere, then you can move sideways in the tree by asking when, what, who and where questions. So now you understand how to use questions to navigate into a person's mind. Let's take a little pause to reflect on all this. Can you think of any situation at work where you'll be needing to understand a person with green open questions? Out of all the green verbal techniques, the questions, which we've just covered, are the most commonly used. But what about the other seven techniques? 
Let's take a look at each of these techniques one by one. Cheers, here's to Henrik, who spent so many hours of his personal time to organize this trip for us. Positive phrases are when you focus on the glass being half full instead of half empty. For example, by raising a toast to offer encouragement and support to others. When people give official dinner toasts, they usually combine a long string of positive phrases, first about the occasion, then about the theme, to then finish with positive phrases about the recipient's achievements and goodwill. Try this one next time you're at table, you'll see how nice it feels. Green positive phrases can be perceived as blue if the receiver is not owning this opinion. That's why some compliments might feel fake. When a sports coach mentors his star athlete, he's probably earned enough trust to use the mirroring technique. For example, by saying, you talk more about the team dynamics than your performance. It seems that the team is really important to you. Mirroring is like putting a microphone into the other person's head and speaking what they might be thinking out loud, free from your opinions or judgment, which is why it takes a lot of practice to master. When people try using mirroring, they often confuse it with the repeating, which you hear with telesales operators repeating the numbers of your credit card to check they got it right. Repeating is only useful in certain cases, but generally, if you repeat the exact words people use, they might feel that you're mocking them. Mirroring is a great way to help people grow their self-awareness, particularly when you re-express the key words with a neutral or more positive angle. This picture is from an interview by Al Jazeera, which I witnessed in Dubai. The journalist had to use the summarizing technique to help the person being interviewed be more concrete. Summarizing is re-expressing what was said with keywords in a shorter way and is very commonly used by journalists, TV hosts, which is why we chose this icon. This technique is a great way to align everybody's understanding of what was said and can get people who talk too much to get to the point. At work, this is a very powerful technique for focus groups and to close meetings because it helps everybody take away a clearer picture of what has been covered. The FBI uses accusation audits to start a conversation with a hostage taker. For example, you most likely feel that this offer is unacceptable, which lowers the defensiveness of the person who's most likely to respond with a yes as an answer. In our everyday world, we can acknowledge a late work delivery by saying, you probably feel annoyed because you didn't receive my proposal on time. Accusation audits are conditional statements to explicit any accusations which the other could have before they express them. They give you a way to lower the emotional temperature by showing that you understand what they could be blaming you for. When an estate agent chooses the exact right moment to use the unlocking technique, he might ask you, what would be the constraints that would stop you from signing this right now, for example? At work, this is a most useful technique when negotiation gets into a deadlock. You could ask, under what circumstances would you be prepared to agree on this proposal? Unlocking can be a question or a statement, such as, it seems that we haven't yet addressed these following topics, which is used to unlock new missing information or decisions in a conversation. I was once hosting a culture building workshop for a group of 30 people in a beautifully modern retreat center. People were working on themes in smaller groups. One team, who was tackling the topic of how might we work better as a team, was struggling to get anywhere. When I observed that two people were monopolizing the group's conversation without leaving space for any constructive proposals to emerge, I used the elephant technique when I said, in the past 20 minutes, person X and person Y have been engaged in a passionately opinionated discussion with everybody else listening, while the topic of this group is teamwork. How might we learn about teamwork from this situation? The result was stunning. The group dynamic changed immediately. It's what Finns call putting the cat on the table. This technique is when you express something out loud which everybody obviously notices but doesn't express. 
we decided to call ourselves the Green Elephant to celebrate the positive impact which this simple technique has when it's used consciously. This 2011 advertisement for Charibori's child-free holiday resorts uses the labeling technique. The picture suggests that when you cut along the pink dotted line, you get what this young mother is dreaming about, a holiday without kids. The labeling technique is one of the most commonly used in advertising to appeal to people's positive or negative emotions. Labeling is reformulating the underlying feeling. This is an advanced technique which we recommend only for hosts, conflict mediators, coaches and therapists. Be aware of badly timed and judgment-heavy nonverbal communication when labelling people's feelings because it can easily trigger their ego. As a parent, labelling can help your child to put words on new and difficult feelings to understand. For example, you seem to be feeling upset about something. So we've now covered the eight green verbal techniques. Which of these techniques have you already used? Most likely, you've used some without realizing that there are actually green techniques. The easiest technique to start using immediately is positive phrases. For example, when you want to start your next meeting on a positive note, the non-verbal behaviors, in case you need to recap them, are in the video on three levels of communication. These green techniques and behaviors, however, are only useful when you align them with a green intention. So let's look at these six intentions one by one. Respect is one of the cornerstones of human relationships. It's being okay with others having different opinions, needs, values and beliefs. It's when you can agree to disagree. Without respect, communication quickly becomes conflictual. It helps to think about it as a balance between two complementary faces of respect, self-respect and respect of others. The two faces of respect are hard to balance in relationships. This is a good example of a new construct you might want to add to your constructory. Too much respect of self is called being selfish. With teenagers, we call this being Scrooge. And too much respect of others is being a victim, which we call being Dobby. In communication, respecting others means that you take responsibility for checking your assumptions before thinking they're valid. Respecting yourself means that you learn to listen without the need to always agree or obey the other. Ancient wisdom from the Nunchak Nul, a Native American whaling tribe in British Columbia, says that a person who cannot ask for help is a person who cannot be trusted. If you think about many workplaces today, asking for help is often seen as a weakness or a form of disturbing others, yet it builds trust. To receive trust, you have to give it. It's a two-way bridge, as the green icon suggests. This is where reciprocity is most useful. Our global economy is based on a system of reciprocal trust, which is why, when trust goes down, markets react accordingly. So the intention of building trust can be thought of as building a sense of safety and connection between people and along with the intention of respect, it's essential if you want to cultivate meaningful human relationships. When I moved into my new flat in Helsinki, I naively followed my French tradition of saying hi to all my new neighbours with a bottle of wine as a gift. Some neighbours were uncomfortable because they felt it required reciprocity. They didn't want to owe me anything in return. Kindness is when you intend to show that you care without a need for reciprocity. Kindness is focusing on what others want, not what you would want or what you'd want in return. The art of gifting is one of the oldest ways of building trust across cultures. The three main ways of doing this are either giving an emotional gift, like a kind word, giving a materialistic gift, like a discount, or giving people time to be late, for example. In some cultures, giving people time to be late is a way to test your commitment in business as a measure of how kind you are with your time. 
the cure for boredom is curiosity. In communication, curiosity comes from challenging yourself to let go of the need to be right and simply being open to understand and be surprised. You can cultivate curiosity with creativity and playfulness in your relationships. Curiosity is rooted in our yearning to understand, which drives research and exploration. The intention of learning can easily be confused with the intention of curiosity, because curiosity usually leads to learning. Learning is about myself, which makes it blue, while curiosity is green because the focus is on things outside of myself. This picture from the International Men's March to Stop Rape, Sexual Assault and Gender Violence is a playful way to illustrate the difference between sympathy and empathy. Empathy is putting yourself in the other person's shoes, while sympathy is feeling what it would be like to be in the other person's shoes. In communication, the intention of empathy is essential because it increases your understanding and acceptance of others. Empathy is giving people the credit of doing the best they can with their current and unique circumstances, even if you would do or say things differently. Empathy transforms ego-rooted right or wrong discussions into collectively intelligent conversations. Even though Christians use the word to mean charity, agape is originally a Greek word referring to the highest form of selfless love. When our inner child sees the wonders and beauty around us, we temporarily let go of our desires, needs and goals to see and accept others as they are. In communication, the intention of agape is the most effective way to carry out a presencing type of conversation, which we saw in the Three Levels video. As the green icon suggests, learning to focus on agape in relationships opens us up to having a healthy balance of polarity. So we've now looked at the six green intentions. Now think back to your daily work. Which of these intentions is the most needed for you to be green in your job? If you're a coach, a consultant, project manager, or sales professional, cultivating some of your key relations is an important part of your work. This next part is extremely useful when you want to use green to build trust over a longer period of time. If you're used to managing relations at work, you'll probably have noticed how the overall mood in the relationship changes over time. Let's say that sunny means plenty of trust and good feelings and the rain clouds mean there are tensions and negative feelings in that relationship with your client. Having studied these types of relationships over the last 15 years, I noticed that there was a recurring pattern of mood changes and six key stages. At each stage, like here, when you've just met, there is a communication goal, which here is to get them interested in continuing building your relationship further. At this stage, you'll see the five questions which are most likely on your client's mind when they're thinking about your relationship. You can use this to help you be green and answer these questions before they ask them, which is a great way to be green. In this stage, they most likely are wondering who you are, if you really understand them and if they could trust you. Even though these questions are probably too small for you to read on your screen, don't worry, there's a printable version of this for you. In this same logic, stage two is when you're aiming to sign an agreement or a deal. And as a service provider, for example, your goal here is to delight your client. The typical questions on their mind are about any hidden aspects of your relationship and how to convince their other stakeholders to work with you. Stage three is the honeymoon, just after you've agreed to work together, where the focus needs to be on earning trust. At this point, you need to answer their questions around roles, execution, and measuring the impact of your work. Stage four is the first weak signals which show that the honeymoon is ending. Things get tricky and you might start to lose control over certain aspects of your collaboration. At this point, it's really important to focus on managing their expectations, proactively reassuring your client around any questions about planning, timing, and budget. 
Sooner or later, a minor or larger crisis might occur. When the client, for example, expresses something they're not happy about. Here, your focus needs to be on using the elephant technique if needed and deal with questions they might have about the problem. Often, at this stage, it's tempting to play ostrich and postpone difficult conversations. That usually just makes things worse. If you can move past this stage successfully, then you'll get to the stage of real trust, where it's not a bad idea to ask the client for favors such as a testimonial or positive recommendation, but only after you've addressed their questions about how things went on your shared project. This infographic is obviously a lot to take in, but it's intended for you to print and return to whenever you need to be green in your work relations. We've now covered all the green techniques, the green intentions, the personal construct theory to help you navigate conversations with your green questions. And we looked at the map of how to be green when you want to cultivate relationships over time. This visual is also available as a downloadable infographic for you to print and keep. May the green force be with you. <laughs>